Can you hear me? Now it's on. Now we practice being rock stars with microphones. <laughs> we have to remember to keep our voices up. That's <laughs> right. No whispering. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Hi, everyone. I should say right from the beginning, my name is Grace, but I was not the inspiration for Grace in Mothered. <laughs> <laughs> Zoya and I didn't even know Did each not other. Know. <laughs> she wrote Grace, so. Zoya, I'm so excited to be here with you tonight to talk about Mothered. I feel like I've been waiting to sit here and have a conversation with you since the manuscript first came in over a year ago. And now the book is out, and it's just so exciting to be here. And I wonder if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about the book. Okay, I will give you a brief, <laughs> spoiler-free description. The essence of the book is a woman grappling with the ghosts of her past. And it starts with Grace, who's in her mid-30s, and she is a hairstylist by day and a catfisher by night. And shortly after purchasing her first house, there is a pandemic, and she loses her job. And her mother, from whom she's been estranged for a good 20 years or so, suggests that she can come and live with her and help pay the bills. And it's really an offer she can't turn down, though maybe she should have turned it down. <laughs> In retrospect, maybe. <laughs> so Jackie comes to live with her, and it seems that somehow Jackie has brought with her the ghosts of Grace's past. And things get worse. That's all I'm going to say. That's a pretty, I think that's a pretty enticing uh, thumbnail into the book. And I'm, you know, I'm just, Grace is such a compelling character because she is, she does have so many things going on. And I'm, I'm curious about where, where did Grace come from in your head? It was, is she, is she based on someone specifically? Were you thinking about a situation? So when I was toying with novel ideas, and this was prior to the pandemic, I floated a couple of ideas to my agent. Ironically, one of those ideas was a pandemic story, not this story. And the other one was just something I sort of said to him off the cuff as a joke, where I said, you know, I had had this moment where I was standing in my mother's apartment, and it occurred to me that if the two of us ever lived together again, one of us wouldn't make it out alive. And he was like, oh, that's a great premise. And I was like, no, that's a terrible <laughs> premise. <laughs> but he's like, no, you could really do something interesting, you know, with the way that you do mother-daughter stories. And so I thought about it, and it was immediately obvious that if I was going to explore something like that, it would have to be with characters who were absolutely nothing like my mother or like me. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking of characters who were very different. And... And that was sort of the origins of Grace and Jackie initially, was to think of people who were wildly different than me, but that still had a very dysfunctional relationship, because of course that's the essence of their relationship, is they have their dysfunctions, they parted ways for many years. You know, Grace does have this idea that coming back together as adults, that they can leave the stuff from the past in the past, but of course that does not happen. Well, I think that is so interesting, and I, I'm imagining that conversation that you had with your agent because the idea of, you know, I I'm love my mother very much, but the thought of living together again, especially in forced circumstances, doesn't really sound that <laughs> appealing to me at this point in my life. And I, I think that you, you know, you've explored mother and daughter relationships before to great effect in your books, and I think that's a, it's it's an area where you, you have a lot of good insight, but there's there's some other interesting familial relationships in the book, too. And I think about uh, Grace had a sister named Hope. Um, and I, without, without spoiling anything, you know, Hope, I Hope is not around anymore. And I think that's, a, that's an unresolved trauma. You were referring to sort of the ghosts of Grace's past that Jackie and Grace haven't fully dealt with. Can you talk a little bit about that sister relationship in the story? Um, well, to talk a little bit more broadly about sure. familial relationships and why I keep coming back to them, you know, first of all, everybody has the universal experience of having been a child of somebody. Um, we've all had parents, and there's for me, there's 
that is the strongest relationship, like the truly the most formative relationship is those early family years. And in my case, I also had a sister. So I know very well about being both very close to your sister, because Grace is very close with Hope, and yet they are very, very different. Mm -hmm. And so I would not say in any way that that's autobiographical either, but it is in that sense kind of natural to draw on these very deep, complicated relationships that I understand because those were relationships that I had, and mm -hmm. they seem like tr very universal relationships to me, which is why I keep writing about them, and probably always will. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a it's a universal experience that I think we can all we can all relate to those kinds of relationships. Perhaps not as fraught as <laughs> hopefully uh, not. Hopefully not all <laughs> as fraught as as Grace and Jackie's and. There is, again, without, without giving any spoilers to the book for those of you who haven't read it yet, that, uh, that relationship between Jackie and Grace and the, the close quarters that they're in when, when Jackie moves in, we do sort of move into some, there are some dream nightmare sequences and one of the most compelling things to me when I first read the book was not always knowing where, where I, whether, whether what I was reading was happening or if it was a dream and, and where that was gonna come out. And I wonder if you can kind of talk a little bit about how you decided to, f to frame some of the parts of the book that way. Yeah, so, so as I said initially, like when I had the initial idea, I knew that Grace was going to sort of experience being haunted by her past. And initially, I didn't know exactly what that was going to look mm -hmm. like. So just to talk a little bit about my process and how like a story is developed, um, I assume some people here are, are writers. Yes, writers in the audience. I know you guys are, don't be so shy. <laughs> so uh, most writers put themselves in one of two categories, either pantsers, people who write by the seat of their pants, or plotters, people who write a plot. I call myself a directional pantser. So I definitely write by the seat of my pants, but I always know something that I'm writing toward. I usually know approximately how a book is going to end, and I know something that happens in the middle. And this happens during a time which could last for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, where I'm just thinking about the story. I'm just trying to get a handle on what it might be, what it feels like, who are these characters? Where do they live? What do they do? And during that process of thinking about mothered, I kind of landed on, okay, maybe her past is told through dreams. And maybe they are these dreams that start to feel so real that she can't tell the difference between, you know, what is reality and what is a dream. And using that as a device, it allowed me to tell all of her backstory with these dreams. So I don't have to have traditional flashbacks mm -hmm. in the story. You know, I really got to use these dream sequences where initially they start out in ways that are very realistic, where maybe you think it is just a flashback that we're just going back in time for a minute, but they all go off the rails at some point in some way that is truly beyond what Grace would have experienced and you know like, okay, this, this is a nightmare. But as time goes on and with the quarantine and how difficult a time they're having, it does get harder and harder for Grace to sort of tell the difference, even for herself, because of how realistic they feel. And was there a moment when you were writing where that kind of clicked into place that these, that these dream sequences were going to become more and more diffuse and more and more horrifying, sort of, as, as we go along? I mean, I kind of knew that that had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at one point, before I actually chose the dream idea specifically, I had toyed with the idea of somehow, like, having the, the people from Grace's past, like, literally walk through the front door and have Jackie experience them, them too. Oh, um, and then I opted not to do that, but there still is like that level, like they feel that realistic that that after the fact, you know, Grace isn't quite sure. It makes her, because all of the dreams kind of go off the rails in a certain way too, it makes her doubt 
what she actually experienced at the time. Like she thought she had her set memories of those experiences, but they're all a little different in the dreams and they feel realistic enough that it, it starts to truly make her doubt her own sanity. Well, I think being in a being in a pandemic situation, I think a lot of readers can probably relate to that a little bit too. Hopefully not to that extreme, but where, you know, at, at the height of being being stuck at home and kind of having reality go a little sideways and thinking about that. I mean, I'm curious, just as part of your writing process, did you go down other roads as you were thinking about how this was going to work or once this came to you, is that... Yeah, once it, once it came to me, once I get to the point where I start writing a novel, mm -hmm. I write toward that end that okay. I've already kind of decided. Um, That's the deliberate pants. Yes, absolutely. You know, and I don't want to, you know, be at all critical of people who are pantsers and don't do that, but sometimes you can get kind of lost in the middle of the story, and, you know, I don't want that to happen. So <laughs> typically at the point that I start writing a novel and I know how it's going to end, like I'm ready to write the book, even though I don't know all of the details of what's going to happen in the middle mm -hmm. of the book, I'm ready to write it and I'm confident about the choices that I've made, that it's enough to keep me on track to get to the end of the book. And is that, has that been your experience with all, so this is your fourth novel, has that been your experience with each book or is that, a, is that something that you've sort of developed over time with your writing career? Um, it has been my experience with each book, though this book, Mothered in specific, specifically, um, was very different. Like other aspects of my process changed because of the pandemic. You know, once upon a time, I hate this term, but you know, people call a really fast draft a vomit draft. I hate that expression. But anyway, I did used to write really fast first drafts where I would just try to get it down in three or four months. For some reason, maybe because I am a pantser, I had this idea that I would lose the story. Like if I didn't work on it all the time, every day for three or four months, that the story would somehow disappear. But during COVID, I, my brain was just not in it. Like, like with everybody else, I needed a lot of downtime on the sofa watching true crime and <laughs> a lot of time Relatable. Just, I know, <laughs> where I just, I couldn't read very much, I couldn't work very much, and then there was very d various drama happening with family members, I won't get into it. But there was a lot of stuff happening that made it impossible to write that, that three or four month first draft. So I ended up writing Mothered over about a year and a half but there were big chunks of time in there where I wasn't working on it. And what I found was, during those chunks of time, I could actually think about the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that instead of trying to write something very quickly, I could take my time and make decisions and think about what I'd already written and what that was setting up and what I might do next. And it turned out to be a very productive process. So I just finished writing a new draft of a book and I used the exact same method where I took my time. I wrote it over nine months. So the essence is still the same mm -hmm. of knowing when to start and writing, you know, toward the end. But now I like to take my time and think about it more. So that was, I guess, a gift that I got from the pandemic. Thank you, pandemic. <laughs> Well, I mean, it comes through on the page because the book unfolds in such a deliciously suspenseful way and we're just, we're building the tension and building and it's, it's clear that you were able to think about that and really make it perfect. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm biased, of course, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, you know, one thing, so many writers talk about that writing is such a solitary craft um, and, and whether you're in a pandemic or not when you're writing a book, that it is, you're sitting down, you're, you're, the story's coming out of your head, you're by yourself. But you, you have talked, we've talked in the past about you view writing and your books as sort of a way to build bridges to people. And I'm curious, and I, I think that's so lovely, and I'm, I'm curious if you, if there are certain things that you are hoping readers take away from Mothered or things that you were trying to say to folks. You know, after my first book was published, Baby Teeth, which of course, it was a first book, so I had no expectations of 
what it was going to be like to be a published author or anything. And one of the things that I discovered, which absolutely has to do with building that bridge, is learning how every individual reader brings themselves to a book. And every individual reader experiences a completely different book. And it was like mind blowing to understand that. Because you know there isn't one version of my book. There's however many hundreds or thousands of people who have read my book, that's how many versions there are. So in terms of like what I want people to get out of any of my books, and this is true for Mothered or anything else, is just that they're in there and in that moment and that they get something out of it. It's like I don't even care personally what it is because if people enjoy it while they're reading it, they're getting something on a personal level that I can't even know about. You know, it could have something to do with a dysfunctional relationship or with dreams or with being isolated or it could be almost anything. Um, I just like the idea that when people are reading my book, like we're having a collaboration. I'm far away, you don't know you're collaborating with me, but it is a collaboration. So I just like that sort of whole aspect of it. Yeah, that's really profound and interesting. And I'm, I'm imagining you, particularly when Baby Teeth came out and you're touring and you're meeting so many people who have read the book. I mean, were, were there any experiences that stood out where someone told you at that point something that the book had meant to them or something they'd taken away that you were just really surprised by? The, the biggest one with baby teeth, and these were mostly people who messaged me. Um, I'm trying to think how they, some of them I guess it was through my website, sometimes it was through Instagram, because you can me you know message people you don't know through Instagram, or how many people reached out to me who either had Crohn's disease or had another sort of chronic illness. Mm -hmm and how seen they felt. Um, and it was really interesting with some of the people with Crohn's disease. I mean, by them saying that and that they felt seen, I felt seen. And you know, some of them were saying, I had the exact same experiences with Crohn's disease. It's like, well, I've never met another person who had those exact same experiences. So for somebody to say that back to me, it made it as validating and as important to me as it was to the person who read the book. So it's been very interesting, but with each of my books, there have been examples like that, that of people who have reached out to say something like really personal, like really personal about how the books touched them. I never expected that ever in a million years, um, but it's, it's like sacred that that happens. Yeah, that's really amazing. I mean, has that has that changed, you know, now that you are four books in, well, I guess five, including the one that you're working on now, do you keep a, a reader of any sort in your mind when you're, when you're writing a story, or is it really this is the story that you're telling and it will be received by the readers as they receive it? Yeah, I mean, whether this is a good approach or not, I do believe in writing the book that you want to read. Um, at least it's a... It's a steady starting place, you know, that, okay, at least I'll enjoy the book and I will have done with the book what I wanted to do with it. Um, especially as time has gone by and I have more books and I have more mm -hmm. readers and more followers, I cannot write to people's expectations, you know. And it's not that I don't think about them. You know, I definitely write things where I'm like, oh my God, people are going to think I'm crazy, <laughs> people are going to be offended, but I still have to do that <laughs> right. um, but yeah so I write for myself as my first reader and then just pray that there are enough other readers who will come along with me on my <laughs> crazy journeys well it seems like it's working out thus far <laughs> <laughs> so far knock wood um, I want to shift gears a little bit because there was something that that we were talking about earlier when we were back in the green room um, about unreliable narrators and you have been called, and I don't have the source of where, where you've been called this, the queen, the of, queen unreliable. of unreliable narrators. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I know you also have sort of a complicated relationship to that <laughs> term and that idea. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because yes. Grace certainly, 
you know, there's there's a lot going on with Grace. I would not call her an unreliable narrator. Okay. I know everybody else will call her an unreliable narrator, but let's let's backtrack to this term, unreliable narrator. So I feel like this became a popular term around the time of Gone Girl. And I would argue that Gone Girl really is an unreliable narrator. I mean, she is getting one over on her husband. She's getting one over on the readers to a certain degree. But it really, that term for me now really makes me stop and say, why, what is it about this character that they're being called unreliable? They're almost always women. I feel that needs to be said. Sometimes it's because they've changed their mind about something. Sometimes it's because they have a mental illness. Sometimes it's because they're drunk. The girl from the train mm -hmm. was always referred to as an unreliable narrator. And then in 2018, I read a nonfiction book called The Trauma Cleaner. And the, the person who the book was about was called an unreliable narrator. And I'm like, how can a real person be an unreliable narrator? I'm like, what is going on? And so I like, I, that's when I really stopped and thought about what this term means. And I think that the author of the book chose to call this person an unreliable narrator because she had many very different stages in her life. She had endured a lot of trauma. You know, she really had a lot of very dramatic changes from where she was at the beginning to where she was at the end. So then I started thinking, okay, are you an unreliable narrator if you're just not sure what's going on? Mm -hmm. If you're, are you an unreliable narrator if you're telling the truth to the best of your ability, but you don't have all the information? Are you an unreliable narrator if you start down one direction and then change your mind and go a different direction? And it really started to seem to me that this is a very problematic term because of course the essence of fiction is you're going to have an imperfect character with a lot of flaws who is trying to do something who if they travel the traditional character arc, they're going to be a different person by the end of the book is every single person an unreliable narrator? Yeah, it's almost sort of like it complicated became synonymous for unreliable. Yeah, and the fact that it's, it's a term that is always used for women, to me is the other aspect of it that's very problematic mm -hmm. because I feel now it's almost used as like a warning. Like this is a character you can't trust and it's always this is a woman you can't trust. So I feel like the term should only be used for protagonists who are intentionally misleading. And I would say to that, that the book, The Work in Progress I just finished, that is my first truly unreliable narrator, that I absolutely did write an unreliable narrator, but it's not Grace. All right. Well, without, without going too far down the path of your unfinished work, I am curious though, did you set out to make that character in this new project an unreliable narrator or is that how they became? I knew she would have to be because she is manipulating everything. Okay. So, and th I think that's a reasonable definition for someone who is an unreliable it's narrator. A very because she's manipulating everybody in her life. So, I think that the readers can infer from that you know, that she may not have a ton of integrity or maybe she can't be relied on for any, you know, particular thing, so. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I'm, would you call, what would you call Grace then in terms of her, Okay. her so intentions are good. Right, now here's an element, this isn't giving, this is not a spoiler, you find this out on like page four, Grace, and I did mention this, Grace catfishes people. Yep. And you could say, well, if she's a catfisher, she's kind of a liar because she's pretending to be, di be different people online. And that's true, she is pretending to do that. But from Grace's perspective, which I do care about my character's perspectives, she imagines that she's being a knight in shining armor with the way that she catfishes people. She imagines she's that she's trying to help them. She is trying to help these women not be dependent on, not need a man or need their support or compliments or whatever it is that they're s seeking. So, and also she's very conscious of the fact, like those are decisions that she made. So 
I don't consider her unreliable in that aspect. And in terms of other things that happen, she's doing the best she can with what she understands about the truth at any given moment. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that makes a person unreliable because yeah. I think aren't we all doing that all I the time? I think you make a strong case. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though talking about Grace's life online that that she is you know being different people online with with these mostly women that she's interacting with. And social media does play, you know, a large part particularly during this book when she's at home. Yeah. Um, and not seeing a lot of other folks, it does. It is a large part of her life, um, and we also know that social media in general can be a, a large part of driving conversation around books. Um, certainly, you were talking earlier about readers messaging you through various social channels and and connecting with readers that way. What is what's your relationship like with social media? I mean, do you do you try to engage with readers really actively that way? Have you found it to be helpful? Has it affected your writing process? It's very complicated. Yeah. It is very complicated because I am very active online. I try to be very appreciative. You know, if somebody tags me in a post on Twitter or Instagram and they say I loved your book, I try to say thank you to every single person who does that. Um, but I'm also always aware of the limits it's like I want to be myself and seem like myself, but I'm always aware that there are aspects of social media that just aren't real. And even though I always want to truly seem like myself online, I mean, people don't know anything about my life. It's like they only know the tiniest little bit about, oh, here's my good thing that happened now. I mean, as with anybody else, I post mostly good news online. And it's like nobody lives in a reality where things are just about your great updates. It's like, that's just not life. So, so it's very, it's complicated. And it is, it is more complicated, I think, also for being a hermit. I am basically a hermit. <laughs> and for being a writer, which is very solitary. And it's like that, that aspect of getting some interaction from real people is fantastic and very meaningful. But then sometimes it seems like it's not real, too. So, also, I overthink everything. So that's a problem. That's a writer's problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Well, was that was that part of the impetus of of adding this part to Grace's story that that she does have this sort of rich life where she is being different people? I mean, for Grace, like, I mean, this is terrible, but she's kind of her best self with the person that she is when she's not being herself mm -hmm. online. She's a better version of herself, like very consciously and very intentionally. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gives her an opportunity to perhaps, because she is sort of trying to help these people that she's connected with online, it does give her kind of an opportunity to maybe make up for some of the things that she has failed at in her real life? Yes, and I, I'd also, like, just from the, from the writer's perspective of why, why did I make her a catfisher? Um, I wanted her to have a hobby, and I was thinking about a hobby for her, and I wanted her to have a bad habit. Mm -hmm. And, well, and I made it both, <laughs> so it's both. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't, like, thought to myself that much, like, what does it say about Grace that she's all of these other people who are maybe better than who she is? Because, of course, she is lying in that moment. Can you, can you be a better person when you're not being honest? I, I don't know if that really works. Yeah, it's a, it's a different, it's just a different version. Yeah. It's maybe perhaps saying some of the things that she can't say in right. the situation she's in. Being the person maybe she wishes she could, would have the confidence to be in real life, you know, to say the things that she wishes she could say. I mean, I think a lot of us probably have like, you know, fantasy conversations in our head. I mean, I guess for her, she's like taking it one step further <laughs> where she has her fantasy conversations with real people. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, in, a f in the few minutes that we have left before we open it up for questions. I mean, I, 
we did talk a little bit about kind of how your your writing has evolved over the course of the books that you've written and the manuscript you're writing now and which will be your fifth book and and obviously you're here in the library tonight and this is such a wonderful place to be launching mothered do you when you reflect on your journey as a writer thus far and hopefully a long journey still to go are there things that you would either like to go back and tell debut author Zoya, or that you would tell aspiring writers who might be here and looking at your path and thinking, wow, how do I find that kind of success? Oh my goodness. If I could go back to debut Zoya, man, would I tell her some stuff. Like, I would really tell her some stuff. <laughs> and like it, what? it might scare her and then she might never leave the house for real. <laughs> well. So maybe that wouldn't work. So my first ever author event, I mean, in hindsight, like I can't believe this happened, but my first ever author event was at Book Expo at Javits in New York City. I mean, it's insane. It threw you right into the fire. It's completely insane. And it's like, I don't travel. I truly, I'm a hermit. I don't travel and I traveled and I went to this gigantic venue. I had no clue what I was doing, sitting on a panel. I'd never been to Book Expo. I'd never been to any book event. So I, truly to God, had no idea what I was doing. And when I think back on it, I, like, I have no idea how I got through that. What so, do you remember of that day? I mean, what was it like? It was so, it was, talk about out of body. I mean, it was so out of body. Because I was there, like, with my whole publishing team. It was, like, the first time I'd met them at this huge venue. And I cannot express enough how strange it is to go from sitting in your room by yourself for years, years writing by yourself, and then you're supposed to be the entertainment. It is like not a natural fit. I think for a lot of authors, it's like, I'm an introvert and a hermit. I'm like, why am I on the stage with a microphone? This is like <laughs> bizarre. So it was very out of body. I don't know how I could have warned that version of myself, how, how weird prepare. it was going <laughs> to be. Um, but it truly, it, you know, for all those years that I was sitting at home alone, it had never occurred to me ever that I would be out doing public appearances and speaking to people. Like, it just never occurred to me. Because writing a book, when you're in the act of writing a book, has nothing to do <laughs> with talking about it for an audience later on. I think that's probably a really interesting tidbit for, for aspiring writers to know, though, because you're so deep in the writing for so long. And that's the first part of a book's journey. And then if you're lucky and the book is published and it finds readers, then you're going to have this whole additional part right. of that journey right. that you might never have thought of. And s there are some writers out there who have used social media better than I have who, you know, I did learn a lot about the publishing industry from Twitter, I will admit. Um, but there are other people who I think who have used it better, who are more knowledgeable, who maybe, you know, at the point that they publish their first book, they won't be as naive as I was. They might maybe could anticipate some things a little better than I could. It's, I didn't think any of that was going to happen. It's like I really didn't. So now I've been trying to catch up for years on, like, how to actually be a professional author in public. Well, does it, does it, I assume it gets easier the more you do it. It does get easier. <laughs> it does. Well, that's good. Now that uh, I have one last question, uh, which I may have some follow-up questions to, we'll see. Um, how, now that the book is out, Mother's Out, you know, we, we had it available in an early program on Amazon so readers could read it a little bit before pub date. It's been out for two weeks. How, how has it been? Uh, considering that when you started writing this book, the world looked very different and became very different while you were writing it, and now we're here, sitting here. What, what, has, what has it felt like? Uh, well, my unhelpful answer is, is it still surreal? It is surreal. You know, I mean, it's, it's still a, you know, a, a process that I did alone. And this is the first public event for Mothered. So 
up until this moment, <laughs> thank you. up until this moment, I was still doing everything from my room. You know, and obviously it's exciting when a book is published and it's out in the world. It's also always a little nerve wracking um, in part because of this lovely thing called social media where people will let you know what their opinions are for the good and the bad. So it's always, it's just always a little bit freaky, but, but now that it's out there, see now I do have this sense now of like, oh, the little bridges are starting to be built. You know, as more people read the book, and then the bridge gets a little more complicated. And what kind of what kind of responses ha have you gotten from readers that have been sort of those bridges? Well, not to like harp on negative things, but there are some people who cannot handle the dream sequences in the book. So I'll just put that out there. There are people who absolutely understand why they're vital to the story and how they function in the story. There are some people who are conf confused. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't necessarily write books to make it easy for readers to know who to cheer for. I kind of like my characters to be quite gray. So for readers who really want to know, like, where's the good guy that I stand behind, I don't really do that. I, I like to make all of my characters kind of a murky, murky aspect of exploring the good and the, and the evil that exists within everybody. So that's definitely some feedback that I've gotten. Um, I've gotten some, you know, I wasn't trying to write a pandemic book. I truly wasn't, but obviously the book has tapped into how a lot of people felt when they were home during those weeks. In that sense, I think in the long run, I will be proud to have preserved in words, what that experience of those early months of the pandemic was like, because on the one hand, we all got used to it, and we all just started doing these things naturally, you know, washing our hands all the time, or wearing masks, or staying home, doing everything on Zoom, it became just automatic. But there's also this sense of kind of moving on and forgetting what it was actually like when we had no idea what was going on. So I'm kind of glad the book preserves that and that when people read it, they recognize that aspect. There are so many small moments in the story, and I know, I'm sorry, I said that was gonna be my last question, but there are so many little small moments. You know, I think about when Grace's friend, Miguel, comes over to see her for dinner, and she's so excited to see him because it's been so long, and they, they set up outside, and they're very carefully setting, sitting apart from each other and enjoying dinner outside, and so many moments like that that, that do really bring back that time. Um, but not in a uh, not in a way that feels shut down, in a way that feels sort of really relatable. And just as just as Grace has a lot of complicated things going on, I mean, it was a complicated time. Right. And Grace is a fundamentally social person. She likes to be with people. It's part of why she likes being a hairstylist. She likes interacting with people. So for her, you know, part of and maybe ties back in with her catfishing too. You know, she was always looking for ways to be social during a time when you couldn't really go out and do stuff, so. Well, and I think the fact that you wrote this book and finished it during this time, when all of this was happening, I think is a testament to the idea that you just keep writing. You write your way through hard situations. And we, we were talking a little bit about that before, but I wonder is that when you, when you think about your career going forward? I mean, is that sort of your guiding principle of? Keep doing it, just keep doing it. I mean, honestly, I just, I can't help myself in a certain way, because I've always been a writer. Long before I was a novelist, I wrote other things. I've written things, I think since I was six, I started writing poetry. In a lot of ways, um, writing is how I process what I experience in the world. Um, but in terms of doing it, professionally or for other people to do it if who want to do it professionally I mean obviously if you don't keep doing it it's not gonna happen <laughs> it's just so simple so you know I I'm always going to write something even if I were writing something that wasn't necessarily to be published though now that I'm a published author I have to say 
you know, the readers are half of it. So is, is a book a book if there aren't readers for it, if it's just something I write for myself? So I very much have changed my ideas about mm -hmm. that over time. In spite of writing the book I want to read, there is still very much this reality of writing a book as a, as a means of connecting with other people. Well, I wish I had another hour to talk to you about that and about your poetry, because I'd really like to get, get into that. <laughs> but I think we'll open it up for some questions now. Thank you, Zoya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gracie and Zoya. Elise has a microphone there, so um, we'll bring the house lights up. So we can see you, and um, if you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, somebody All has right, a question. In the back row there. Hi. I think it did help me. I was always. Um, this might sound crazy, but I was. You know, obviously, I've known for a long time before I started, started writing novels that novels existed, and I could have written novels before, and I didn't. Um, and I, for a long time, I was very intimidated by the idea of writing novels because I knew, unlike being a filmmaker, where there are different people doing different aspects, that I would have to do every single part. You know, that if I didn't put it in the book, readers wouldn't know about it. So I think writing screenplays, it helped me learn many things about structure, storytelling, characters, and then ultimately when I started writing novels, I still, still thought of it initially as what are the different hats that you wear as a filmmaker? And I had worn a lot of hats as a filmmaker, so I had been an actor. So I would think of all of the elements of a novel as like, okay, there's the writing part, there are the characters and the acting, there's the editing, there's the cinematography, there's the production design, there's the directing. And it, to have had that experience in film allowed me to understand what a novel, like the different elements that needed to be present in a novel for it to feel like a complete experience, if that makes sense. Perfect sense. I saw some hands starting to go up last time. Don't be shy. Right okay. up front, Vivian. Okay, Viv. <laughs> <laughs> now you get the microphone. Uh oh. <laughs> Yes. And I was thinking and talking and thinking about that in the sense of both writing with the end in sight, but not knowing what happens along the way, and also putting the characters in an extraordinary circumstance that a whole lot of ordinary people would feel. Yeah, so some of my interests in character development and story ideas are holdovers from my interest in film, which you're absolutely right. I can't believe you remembered that so well, because I wouldn't have been able to phrase it that well, but yes, that is, was exactly my goal. Like, as a filmmaker, I wanted to explore elements of horror stories, elements of fantasy stories with characters that were absolutely grounded in reality to see how would a real person react to this extraordinary situation. So that has still continues to be my goal with every book that I write is to have some different extraordinary situation. I mean, ironically with Mothered, as you said, that was a situation that all of us experienced, which is very unusual. Um, but to see, yeah, when you delve deep into somebody's psychology, how do they react 
to this situation. To me, like that is the entire reason why I, I do anything, is to explore those psychological aspects of how would a real person react. Now, I realize grace may not be in that we all experienced, you know, the pandemic, but Grace is not all of us. <laughs> she is not how most of us reacted during the pandemic, but obviously it was still very interesting to explore, you know, how do her dark sides manifest and become amplified when dealing with a situation like that. Fascinating. And back there? Hello? Oh, it's working, okay. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, so as your first drafting process tra changed through the process of writing this book from that like three to four month fast draft to the longer process that you have now, have you found that that makes a difference in like the second draft editing process? Like is it a truly different experience than you had with your fast drafts or? Absolutely, and that is a large part of why I decided to do it. Um, you know, before you're a published author, you can spend as much time with your own draft as you want, and you can rewrite it to your heart's content, but when you're a published author, there are people waiting to read your next draft. And what I found with my second and third books, even though, like, people said, oh, we want to read that first draft, I should not have shown them that first draft. Uh, because what ended up happening, which was very difficult for me, is I ended up in this editorial quagmire where it was very hard then for me to do the revisions for the book while listening to other people's ideas about what it needed and to understand their ideas, to feel the confidence of even how to incorporate their ideas. Um, and I was just talking to my agent about this today actually where I, I told him it was Caroline Kepnes who wrote the, the You books who advised me to hold on to my books for as long as I can. And so now, before I show a book to my agent, because he's the first person who sees it, I want to feel like this is basically a finished book. This is absolutely as far as I could take this book by myself, hoping that I never end up in editorial quagmire ever again. One last question. Jack. Do you think, I know you, you, you write what you know and you write what you love, but do you think you'll always have the Pittsburgh character in all of your books going forward? It's extremely likely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it, <laughs> so please do. <laughs> I mean, with, with Wonderland, obviously they needed to be in a different location, right. so you know they're, the, they're in the Adirondacks, but still her family is from Pittsburgh. Um, and when I wrote Baby Teeth, I was not living in Pittsburgh at that time. I had lived in Rochester, New York for many years. I still had it take place in Pittsburgh. Part of why I did that, you know, before I sold Baby Teeth, I had written five other novels, and four of them were speculative fiction. Well, we're so proud that Zoya Stage is from Pittsburgh, writes in Pittsburgh, and we get to share her with the world. Let's hear it for Zoya. Thank you guys so much. And while she takes a moment to catch her breath, White Whale is here with books for sale. We're gonna set up the signing table over here. Stick around, talk to friends, talk to Zoya. Thanks so much for coming out.